we see countries like the Scandics who have a much more business approach to renewables than, for example, Germany. We see that the different asset classes are treated the same and that this is also an impact on the way how to do the transactions because you wouldn't enjoy specific rules for energy assets in a jurisdiction where energy assets, be it conventional or be it renewable, are just treated the same. Hello and welcome to Energy Unplugged by Aurora. This podcast features various experts from Aurora having in-depth conversations with key industry leaders, policymakers and academics from all over the world. It explores the hottest topics across the energy market and gives a unique perspective on major energy issues. This episode is one of the series featuring energy transition leaders who will be speaking at our Spring Forum. The forum takes place in London on Wednesday the 29th of September. For more information, go to auroraer.com slash events. Hello, I'm Hans Koenig. I lead Aurora's consulting work in Central Europe, working from a Berlin office, and I'm joined today by Christoph Torwege. Welcome, Christoph. It's great to have you on the show. Thank you, Hans. We always like to start these podcasts on a somewhat personal note. So uh, could you tell us how how did you end up specializing in energy law of all the of all the possible fields you could have gone into? I started uh, to be a lawyer in 2003 and joined at the time PwC. And um, looking back, um, it was probably a right decision. But at the time, in M&A tax, which was quite challenging, um, but <clears throat> it served for many, many um, large transactions where I was a part as a junior associate in the M&A sector. And when I moved uh, 2004 to um, PwC Legal, uh, stayed in the M&A sector, also a large transaction, but it was always corporate M&A meaning we were working on deals where um, parking lots, or as we say in German, uh, Parkhäuser have been um, sold and acquired or um, whatever chemical uh, plants or uh, corporate um, assets, always with employees and, and always coming from quite different um, areas of business, as in 2003, only the very few law firms had a vision to say, we concentrate on kind of sectors. So I worked through all sectors, as we would say today, which um, is a bit puzzling from time to time and challenging as well. And in 2004, there was one sector coming up uh, in the legal um, advisory area, which was energy, renewable energy in particular. So we had solar farms and wind farms and offshore wind farms, and all of that was new, and it wasn't standardized at all. So um, the developers and the banks and the investors, they, they went basically to the larger players in the market um, to have their transactions, to have their business guided in a legal way and in a good way and to develop standards. And this was the first time I, I got in contact with Energy Law, 2004. And it was basically uh, like an adventure. So new in all aspects and very interesting. So I found it quite interesting uh, and uh, decided uh, as far as you can decide as a senior associate to concentrate uh, on that uh, kind of business, not particular on that kind of law, but on that kind of business. And ever since um, I was working um, for energy driven clients, um, except for a break of four years when I was head of legal in an international group. Actually in 2006, um, we had the first um, assignment uh, on an offshore wind farm in the Baltic Sea, Germany, which which was at the time geo-free. And uh, there were definitely no standards. It was all made by hand. 
no templates available, which was really, really good, really interesting work. And today, um, I think um, we have such a, a big and large client base in Osborne Clark because they feel that we are really excited by what we're doing. So the, they feel that all the members of our energy and utility sector, as we call it today, we know that we have specialized, uh, that they like what they do and that they like the theme, the energy and renewable theme, which ends up as being sustainable um, in, in particular, and that they are um, with it by heart. So um, the banks, developers, investors, and utilities, utilities they probably um, feel that in a way. So that's I mean, why I ended up in energy law. That certainly sounds like something we and uh, kind of like our teams have in common, kind of like this uh, this, this passion for the energy transition. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, as I said in the introduction, you're an internet you're the international sector leader um, for energy and utilities at, at Osborne Clark. Uh, can you can you tell us a bit more what that actually means? Because uh, after all, a lot of the legislation that applies to projects and uh, transactions is still national. Uh, so at least that was my assumption. Uh, what what does what does that international job uh, part of your job mean? It means um, for one thing that I work with many people from many team members from uh, the other jurisdictions other than Germany, which I personally like very much uh, mm -hmm. because it's always good to have such an international exchange. In terms of a role, it means that <clears throat> I'm working together with the other international sector leaders. Uh, we have uh, a couple of sectors, not only energy and utilities. So we exchange our ideas, how, for example, does the digital business TMC sector develop itself or the um, transport automotive sector develop itself? And what can we translate into the energy sector from, from those um, expertise, which is created at the other place? Um, in terms of the role as well, it's a bit a coordinatory role, making people speak to each other, I would say. Because Osborne Clark, as an organization, is developing very much over the last years. We are growing um, at an enormous rate. And that means that, in the essence, we have more people. And to be, to be successful, uh, the first thing you need to do is make these people speak to each other and know what they're doing. And uh, this is one, one particular aspect of my role. I, I'm, I'm really fond of... Uh, to, to connect people, to, to, to bring together uh, Giovanni from Italy, speaking to Alex from the UK on particular projects. And uh, this is also what makes Osborne Clark in a way successful because we approach our work and uh, of course also in pitches our clients as a true international team. So we staff on an international basis because we have joined the, the, the network and we have merged the expertise from all the countries to one expertise. Uh, and this is bringing up very good results. In terms of law, uh, this is probably also um, something of this role because we, we can share the ideas to particular problems. This is also one of my, my tasks to pick up the ideas. How do we tackle a certain legal problem in Spain which is a domestic legal problem, for example. Mm -hmm. And what can we derive from that uh, particular domestic solution to that problem? Um, maybe in a comparable situation in Germany or in the Netherlands or in the UK. So although we have um, national jurisdictions in, in energy still, um, we share the ideas and see what might be suitable as a solution in a different jurisdiction. Um, and of course, if you, if you come from a regulatory perspective and have a look on it, um, we definitely have a supranational uh, legislation on an EU level in, in, many, in many terms of energy. But uh, when it comes to a project, land law is always a domestic law. Yeah. And whether you have your land secured uh, in Spain is a question of Spanish law and not a question of German law. Yeah. So, um, different layers. And my role is, of course, to, 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 um, to share ideas and to make people sharing those ideas, uh, which was a bit of a um, 
bit of a challenge in COVID times, I have to say. So mm -hmm. I took over the role in January 2021. And this was amidst all the COVID restrictions. And um, how do you, the question for me, the core question was, how do I manage to bring together people uh, in Europe uh, without traveling? And how, how do I keep them motivated to speak to each other? Uh, at, uh, we, we established a kind of a coffee lottery. Mm. So everyone in the energy team um, could participate, sign up and speak to someone uh, who he uh, didn't or she didn't know before. So uh, we tried to connect. And uh, as a reward, it was a bit uh, of me sending uh, a postcard and uh, a bag of sweets. No. Oh. So, <laughs> <laughs> a very creative solution to the yeah, I mean, to, I mean, to the problem keep, of our time set. So. Yeah, keep keep people keep people uh, in a team, and uh, even in, in particular in COVID, um, avoid island thinking. Yeah, that was that was what we tried to manage, and I think that went quite well. But it wasn't uh, only my work; it was the work of the entire team. They were quite committed to stay as a team. It's really good. Excellent. Glad to, glad to hear that. Of course, the main point we need to discuss today is the role of law and the role of lawyers in the energy uh, transition. And it's hard to think uh, of a better uh, conversation partner than, uh, than you for this very important topic. Um, so let's start with quite a broad question. From a legal standpoint, what is special about energy M&A? Um, and how does energy M&A differ from other types of trans transactions, which I know you've worked on, especially early in your career? I think the on the highest level on a, on a overarching level, the answer would be um, it's specialized M&A style, it's project M&A style um, with a clear with a clear stamp of one particular industry. So the M&A corporate style is of course also I think uh, specialized to an extent but in the energy M&A style you will know everyone after a while. So we know our markets friends <laughs> from the <laughs> other law firms. Um, and you see that people say, oh, I'm really happy we have on the sell side slash buy side, um, he or she from that law firm or, oh, okay, uh, we have someone else. <laughs> and we are not that happy about this. So everyone knows each other, we know the investors, uh, the investors know us, we know the banks. And and so it's, what I wanted to say is, it's close shop mm. from working stuff. Everyone knows Every, each other. Everyone knows each other. And that's the reason that everyone is also friendly to each other. Because, <laughs> uh, one day later, you meet um, uh, the person you talked uh, the other day uh, in a different situation. So it's a very close shop. And in terms of style, we have a limited number of interests being merged in a project. And these interests have to be balanced so that everyone goes away and is happy. And there's always, always a way to do that. Um, but you need to know all these interests. And uh, the Can you give you an do, example? Mm, I mean, in a project you have the banks who would like to have a, a good financing rate, the investor who would like to have a good uh, project development uh, fee, um, the, the developer who would like to have a good project development fee, the investor who would like to have a good uh, IRR, and um, maybe uh, these three um, have a look on the land owners who would like to have a good land lease payment. So. Um, there is no specific example. I think the, the topic is that, or the task is that you need to have it all on your plate mm -hmm. and that you realize when you start to over ask because that will block the transaction. And the better you know all the interest, then you better know what's, what's possible for your client. And, uh, and this is, this is, uh, in that particular energy, it's it's a small world, and and you can do that quite in a good way. And uh, if you're specialized, it's a very special market, and uh, this is something which is, I think, um, 
a characteristic of this kind of M&A style. And your, your clients, uh, to a certain extent, expect, expect their advisors to know that. The role of our, our advisory role changed over the years um, from a pure legal advisor to much more of a, uh, and this is what we like, definitely, as a trusted business partner in terms of, is that a good decision, what I'm taking now? Can you please um, assist me taking this decision? And uh, we are happy to do so because we know the market, but it's more than uh, the question whether or not this land usage contract clause might be valid or, or not, or might be a bit too complex or violate general terms and conditions law or whatever. It's a broader job than just advising on the legal structuring. Definitely. We have much a broader um, scope of our work. Mm -hmm. Even not on paper, it's expected by our clients that we know um, we know those the market participants. Uh, an example would be um, we're currently advising on, on, on a larger sales side, um, sales side assignment. And uh, when the finance advisor uh, collected all the interested parties, um, of course, we have been asked whether we know them and, and whether we think that, that the interests of those parties accommodate the transaction. Of course, we come at this from a market perspective, um, and uh, especially in renewables, a lot has changed over the past couple of years in that regard, uh, like in, in most European uh, and many other markets. In fact, uh, new build renewables have reached grid parity with uh, existing conventional assets, uh, which has made our work as market modelers a lot more interesting. And uh, of course, that's also relevant for a lot of renewables uh, transactions. Has it Has this translated into changes on the legal side in the legal frameworks, for instance, or in the way how, how transactions are done? I think yes and no. Um, in, in if, I think if you step out of, this, uh, out of this question when it comes to one specific country, um, we see countries like the Scandics who have a much more um, business approach to renewables than, for example, Germany. Um, we, we see that the different asset classes are treated the same and um, that this is also an impact on the way how to do the transactions um, because you wouldn't enjoy specific rules uh, for, for energy assets uh, in, in a jurisdiction where energy assets, be it conventional or be it renewable, are just treated the same. So in Germany, it's different. We have still um, the Erneuerbare Energien uh, Gesetz, uh, which is the subsidy scheme for renewable energy assets. And of course, this has an impact on the transactions. Uh, we need to observe and we, we need to review whether that particular project is eligible for um, the feed-in tariffs uh, or the auction system or whether whether the developer has treated all the, the rules and, and uh, regulations governing um, the subsidies uh, in, in the right way and things like that, they impact uh, a transaction. And uh, in the moment we have, um, we have a weird situation. The, the energy prices are rising mm -hmm. and um, uh, the construction prices are rising as well. And we see that uh, when in former times, the so-called in Germany EEG project was the one to go for always because it, it, it served for a stable but yet flat income um, from the subsidies. Uh, the PPA projects, they promise much more income because the PPA power prices might be much higher than the auction prices under the Renewable Energy uh, Act. But the EPC prices are high. So some developers, they, I think, um, they might, might, might give away for free <laughs> the EEG uh, auction uh, decisions because the, the rates are so low under EEG in the moment and the EPC prices are so high that if they're going to build it, it's, it's uh, not serving for any um, profits. 
So, so you're talking about uh, 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 developers who already uh, received their EEG yeah. um, uh, well, auction, or they, they received a feed-in premium in the auction, and they and they would still they would they would accept the penalty and rather uh, uh, and rather sell their electricity in the market. Yes, maybe. Or um, they say they say we are not we 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 give away um, the auction decision mm -hmm. um, for free. Uh, just for the reason that if we are not going to to build our project, um, our bid bond uh, will uh, forfeit, and this will cost us a lot of money. Um, and maybe we find someone who who can get uh, better mm -hmm. EPC prices than we do, um, because otherwise we would uh, rather decide uh, to build it as a PPA project. It's it's very unusual times in the moment, uh, driven by many factors, of course. But uh, in the moment, it's really weird. Um, but this is specific, of course. EEG mm -hmm. is very specific. Um, and um, the more merchant we go with the project, the more simpler the uh, transaction will become because a, regula a regulatory aspect will fall away, I think. Mm -hmm. And we are uh, in Germany, uh, of course, uh, quite highly regulated. Very complex situation. So when you work on transactions, um, uh, presumably you uh, every now and then come across uh, roadblocks or red flags, which uh, which endanger or even uh, lead to the termination of, uh, of of a participation in a transaction. What are the most common ones uh, that, that you uh, that you tend to find? Uh, that developed over the last years um, for the reason that um, the most projects uh, need debt. So they are financed by a bank, and um, the risk uh, the risk in a transaction is governed by the yeah, by the standard of risk accepted by a bank. Um, so is the question is is that particular contract bankable or not? And so we had always um, to review our legal situation, uh, be it a land use contract, be it the corporate situation, or be it the PPA or whatever, um, TCMA or O&M contract um, from the perspective of bankability. Mm -hmm. And the more standardized all these contract types got, the, the, the clearer the answer towards the bank, be it uh, be there already or it might be there in the future as financing party, Uh, was simpler to answer. So the the um, red flags basically um, became fewer, a lesser number of red flags um, because we the, the the structure of transaction was much clearer over the years for terms of uh, standardization. Um, but the most common roadblocks are then non-bankability. So a land use contract is non-bank is not bankable, or um, we have we have an EPC which is difficult, um, but as long as all market participants know the bankability standards, um, a project shouldn't shouldn't have red flags. And um, I think we can definitely um, say that in particular the developers, the, the first ones uh, in in that chain of value, uh, they made a, a fantastic job over the last years. They standardized all the terms. And they and they have to speak basically to the to such participants in that market who are not used to speak to to the industry, land users, for example. Um, the um, let's say um, owner of a, of a piece of land who did his his or her entire life uh, agricultural business has now to decide over uh, um, a 17 pages land use contract for solar yeah. or wind. So they, they did a fantastic job in the last years to educate all these, these people, these individuals, and uh, to set a standard for the industry. Okay, okay so in a, in a, in a way, uh, to, to paraphrase slightly, the, the industry has come a very long way since you started yeah. working on this in the early 2000s and kind of everything was done for the first time. Uh, now there's actually, if, if, a, if a developer is professional and kind of like follows the, 
uh, uh, follows the middle of the road solution for um, uh, 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 to to get a bankable project. Um, th there really aren't any uh, any usual red flags or uh, or roadblocks. And the red flags also, of course, uh, it's always always the scope of work question uh, with with the client. Um, uh, what what should we uh, identify as a red flag? It's it's always an individual landscape of risk we need to adhere to. Um, but if you if you have a look on a very early development stage project, it's a it's a different answer probably than um, what you would give if you look on a portfolio which has been in operation for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. There might I mean, still be a land usage contract, a bit difficult, but nobody took it out of the drawer for 15 years. And if you now start to to talk to the land you landowner about one particular clause, this will cause all the trouble which haven't been there for the last 15 years. Okay. So it's yeah. definitely not a red flag. So, so, so some 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 legacy issues, but uh, but by and large things improved. Okay, has the legal structuring of transactions uh, in the power sector changed over the time in which uh, you've been around in the industry? Definitely, definitely. Um, when we started, um, and I'm not even speaking of 2004, speaking of let's say 2014, so eight years ago or seven years ago. Um, we, we advised on probably the largest wind onshore transaction in Europe, which was a 90 megawatt wind farm, 27 wind turbines at the time. And we were all so excited about this. And meanwhile, um, we look on, on portfolio transactions, not with 27 wind turbines, but with 27 wind farms. So first the quantity has changed significantly. Um, we, we discussed in 2014 solar farm acquisitions of a size of five to 50 megawatt, regarded a 20 megawatt wind farm uh, as very large and a 30 megawatt um, a solar farm as particularly large. So, <laughs> and today, uh, if, if I get hold of a teaser um, from a finance advisor, they, they market portfolios with 200, 300, 400, 500 megawatts, uh, even 1.0, 1.5 gigawatt portfolios. Yeah. So the transaction size has, has, has developed a lot. And uh, coming with that, of course, also the transaction style. We see different styles of SPAs. We see different styles of framework agreements. We see different styles of due diligences and uh, how um, the materiality thresholds are different, um, um, much higher than uh, 10 years ago. So um, the qualification and definition of a red flag has changed and... Um, these are the changes. I think it's much more a commodity business right now, but the the challenge to the to the advisors is probably not the asset itself; it's the size of the transaction, and it's it's also the basically the background of the clients and and participants. We see um, a Korean investor investing through a London fund advisor into a Spanish project which has been developed by a southern German project developer. Yeah. So just if you just take the cultural aspects of this transaction, you have Korean lawyers, you have Korean investors, you have UK lawyers, um, you have UK fund advisors, you have Spanish lawyers, Spanish project, you have Spanish landowners, you have uh, um, southern part of Germany uh, developer with their lawyers and in the middle, our team here. So, so uh, the the challenge in that transaction is to is to balance all the particular interests and the particular styles of how to deal with the transaction. The Korean style of the transaction is totally different to what you would uh, have in in the UK with a UK investor. 
and also the familiar familiarities with the market and uh, yes. with, the local, with the local legal systems. Of course, yes, this is also this, something we yeah. we see on uh, on the, from from the from the power market side um, uh, a lot, right? I mean, uh, one of our most important jobs is uh, uh, yeah explaining the German, the Polish, the British power market and how and how it works um, to to people who, who want to invest here, but uh, but who haven't uh, who haven't had exposure to the market yet. So as you said in, in your introduction, the your focus is really on the M&A side, but as a firm, uh, you also have colleagues working on litigation and arbitration. What trends are emerging in this space in the energy sector? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the, the teams um, we have, they are um, specialized. So we have, of course, uh, and. and pure M&A team, we have a regulatory team. And uh, in this respect, we have also a team which um, exclusively deals with litigation and arbitration. This is an international team led by uh, Alexander Kirstein and Greg Fulilov. So they, they run the international arbitration litigation and uh, also uh, with a particular view to energy. And why do we think is that a very important part of our of our practice for energy, um, it's for the reason that in, in, in on a smaller scale, we have a high speed of innovation. So we, 10 years ago, we, we, we talked about solar and offshore and onshore wind. And now we are talking um, of hybrid models, battery storage. Um, we talk about um, hydrogen, and how can we combine all these things together on one particular plot of land, for example? Or uh, what what are what are the the newest innovations, digital innovation in the energy sector? And whenever it comes to innovation, we leave the old technology behind and start to invest in the new technology. And the higher the innovation speed is, the faster the investor would have to leave the old technology because it doesn't generate any profits anymore. And the faster he has to get into the new technology, but not necessarily for the reason of his speed, knowing all the risks mm -hmm. of that new technology. So hydrogen is, is a topic for not so many years now, but we have many, many investors who put a lot of money into that technology already. And if you would ask them, the answer will be, yes, we know all the risks, of course. But let's wait for two or three years. And that's where the international arbitration and litigation team um, finds its justification. They say, um, to get out of an old technology that may create tensions between the parties. Hmm. Because not necessarily all those contracts have to come to an end at that very moment. No. So there might be, there might be a dispute. And also rushing into new technologies for the simple reason that you have to, to invest your money, um, that might also um, create dispute because there was maybe one technical risk your technical advisor didn't see. But that basically crashes your, your profits. So um, you're not necessarily um, suing your technical advisor, but, but you might need to, to have guidance at the beginning of that process to say, if this goes wrong, I need now a litigation, experienced litigation or arbitration a person who gives me guidance how to structure my contracts in the right way. Because if something goes wrong, I would like to be in a good place. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is on a smaller scale, on a project scale. But uh, what we see also is that our arbitration litigation team picks up the larger scale disputes. So we had um, a couple of years ago, we had a, a very unpopular decision of the Spanish government. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Taking back subsidies, for example. And um, this has, this has uh, led to a high grade of frustration of investors. And they lost a lot of money. And uh, they, this is something which isn't the core business of investors, losing their money at such a scale. So they turned their head to our international arbitration team. And they are suing um, uh, Spain 
successfully uh, under the Energy Charter and the um, international arbitration uh, rules. Thank you very, very much for this overview over the areas of, uh, of, of your practice and, uh, and, uh, and how, how they have developed. Um, before we come to the final part of the podcast, I would like to uh, turn towards the future and, uh, and think about uh, a couple of areas that may need changing in, uh, in, in energy law. Um, and, and the first area where I'm interested in is... Um, Uh, in general, any general points you see, uh, like from your experience, where advising on transactions and investments, um, are there any parts where you would say the law needs to change to reflect commercial realities on the ground, which have already changed? Yes, I think that starting with Germany, uh, we need to definitely change uh, the permitting law mm. for solar and for wind both onshore and offshore. It's too complex. It's too slow. And um, I mean, politicians have said they would like to bring it down for onshore wind to three to six months. This is certainly very optimistic. But um, a development phase of five to seven years for onshore wind is certainly too long because it, have, it has to be pre-financed. And if you, if you bear in mind the pre-financing position of a developer in onshore wind, um, we are not talking about 10,000 or 30,000 euros. We are talking about a couple of hundred thousand euros. And um, if you would like to reform, this would one particular area of reformation, which is due to do. And we have a lot of good examples. For example, in the Scandix, you get a permit for a box. You can buy in that geographical box, you can build your wind turbines. And in Germany, you need to point a, a geo, geographical exact data. You need, to, you need to apply for a technically specific turbine. And uh, if you're not meeting your own application information, then you lose your permit or you cannot just build. So this is one area of reform in Germany. Definitely, we need to, I think, rethink uh, legislation in the uh, Renewable Energy uh, Act, Erneuerbare Energiegesetz. Um, um, one thing has been a good thing, uh, the concession uh, fee, for example, which can be paid legally uh, to the municipalities. Um, this, this brought a lot of transparency and, and also compliance into the development uh, phase of, of projects. The municipalities should be beneficiary of such projects And the developers should be legally entitled to make them a beneficiary. And uh, the concession fee has now uh, a new instrument to facilitate this. And if you turn your head to other countries, surely Portugal, uh, we need a bit of a tax improvement uh, when it comes to the transfer of projects at certain stages and regulatory improvements in the same, in the same stage. Uh, you might be prevented from transferring projects once they have certain uh, permissions achieved and you need to uh, erect them first and so it's it's all unnecessary burden for developers at the end um, and uh, I think the French land law could also be a little bit uh, reformed when it comes to energy projects but these are big big topics but uh, definitely um, there's a lot of uh, reformation because uh, if we see what we what we have set, as a goal for us in terms of climate, uh, climate and uh, neutrality of energy, um, energy production, then we need to speed up. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, actually, a lot of the uh, topics you mentioned, where we will also, uh, in terms of acceptance uh, for for onshore wind projects in particular, will also cover uh, at our panel uh, um, in the at, at our Spring Forum on the 29th. So, if you're interested uh, in how permitting needs to change to ensure public acceptance, uh, do join us for the forum. Just to say this again. Oh, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Great. And uh, uh, yeah. So uh, before we close, um, we always have have a very a short section in the end or um, where we ask our guests whether certain concepts are overrated or underrated. Uh, uh, ideal answer is a, a word or a sentence, but 
not five sentences. Uh, and I, I have three concepts I would like to put to you. Uh, the first being the importance of legal structures as a driver or as drivers of asset valuations. Overrated. Legal structures come always from the project. And uh, in the end, it's the um, interests of the parties who drive the asset valuation. Great. The second one is regulator regulatory risk in renewables investing. Overrated and at the same time underrated. Depends on the country. It's a political question. Great. And thirdly, um, and more personally, the benefits of being at an international law firm versus a national one. Underrated. Um, the entire business um, developed to be an international business. And um, one-stop shop is still a principle which facilitates complex uh, transactions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Christoph. It's been a pleasure. And I really look forward to discussing with you at the forum. Thanks, Hans. Uh, so for me and uh, also be very happy to be uh, in that forum. That was Hans Koenig, Head of Commission Projects Central Europe at Aurora, talking to Christoph Torweg, International Energy and Utilities Sector Leader at Osborne Clark. Do keep an eye on our podcast feed for more in-depth conversations with senior members of the energy industry. The best way to do this is to subscribe on whatever platform you use. Thanks for listening and goodbye.